Welcome to Waiting on the Trade, a monthly comics book club for people who can't keep up with monthly comics. I'm Matt Ledger. I'm Patrick Fitzgerald Fleck. And I'm Jonathan Gurney. This month, we're talking about Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys, The Big Lie, a young adult mystery gone no- noir. Noir? Noir. 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 A young yeah. adult mystery gone kind of gnarly. There you go. <laughs> By Anthony Del Cole, Werther Deladera, and a host of other narrative wells. Alright, so in case you need a refresher, The Big Lie features young adult stalwarts Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys teaming up to solve a hard case in a hard town. Because yes, this ain't your grandfather's Nancy Drew or Hardy Boys book. As the comic constantly reminds you, things are dark in this version of the Hardy Boys home town. The lobsters, they don't get out of those traps. <laughs> no. <laughs> no they, well, they do, but only uh, only at the very end. Yeah, not not at a good point. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, Jono, welcome back. <laughs> Oh, thank you, guys. Yeah, um, it's always a pleasure to be uh, invited uh, and then to be able to force you guys to read uh, something that you might not have otherwise picked. Uh, I'm pretty sure last uh, time I picked because I really just wanted people to talk about Die With. So I feel yeah. like you were due for actually picking a book. <laughs> and that was a good that was also a good choice. Um, and so I'm glad to bring it more in line with um, with my choice of Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys, The Big Lie, of course, um, published in 2017. So even before Die, I think, was published. Yeah, it's actually like slight well not older but like slightly older and it has a a sequel kind of that i'm sure we'll talk about a bit as we get into things because that was a big brouhaha for a minute on the comics internet oh and and uh and i think now the publisher is also in more of a brouhaha oh good i'm glad you mentioned it because i wasn't sure if i was going to (laughs) (laughs) oh look i think um i think it's impossible um to discuss uh things like the hardy boys nancy drew um, without at least touching on the fact that the books had to be extensively rewritten uh, in the 1960s uh, because of just just awful depictions of certain minority groups and things like that. And I think that that's a, but I think that that also is what the the series kind of stands for. Is it is it does modernize with the times. It doesn't just kind of stubbornly stick to, uh, well, I mean, in some cases it does, but it doesn't stubbornly stick to some of the outdated things. So it's certainly uh, it's it's fitting that we would discuss that at the same time. I do want to talk about at some point in this, the fact that their tech guy, whose name I'm blanking on at the moment, Tom, but Tom I Swift, have plot yeah, device, Tom Swift, zero never, lines. He had yep. no dialogue. What is up with that? Well, I, I will touch on that. And that is uh, that is actually a very interesting little thing because Tom Swift is actually uh, also an Edward Stratmeyer um, yeah, package novel, character. Yeah. yeah, he has his own book. He's got uh, like 100 books or something as well. Um, to his name, uh, as do some of the other characters that pop up in this graphic novel. The Bobsy Twins. The Bobsy Twins and the Rover Boys. <laughs> oh, really? There you go. Yeah, so this is a very very much a, a, a cinematic universe uh, in, in many <laughs> ways. <laughs> Where are all the spinoffs? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that that's, the, that's hopefully what uh, The Death of Nancy Drew, which is the sequel to this one, will 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 uh illustrate really kickstart the universe <laughs> yeah exactly but i guess like jumping in um have you guys read any hardy boys or nancy drew well i wanted to i guess before we get into that kind of yeah touch sorry upon before i jump ahead <laughs> oh, i just want to touch like touch upon the fact that you kind of alluded to dynamite's been in a bit of hot water at least the past week or so as we've been recording this because they've kind of been catering to comic skate readers and if you don't know what comic skate readers are on i'll link Which to I show don't. notes yeah. i don't want to go into it they're <laughs> bad overall is the thing we are okay. an anti well, comic skate yeah. podcast even no, with perfect. you two not knowing what they are i'm going to take a firm stance on that <laughs> uh, uh, look my my experience with gates is um watergate which was um obviously what brought about the um the end of President Nixon's term and Gamergate, which was just it, a. It's basically um, that, but for comics, actually. Like, that's the short so it, version. Yeah, it's sort of a. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of not trying to be too political, but that was kind of a shit show of like <laughs> the sort of semi outright trolls and things like that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, c- catering to people like that just seems like a mistake uh, long term. And I actually thought about for a minute this week, like, oh, do we have to not talk about the book because the publisher is shitty but i think a we had already picked the book i was kind of excited to talk about it i know you were excited mm-hmm. to talk about it jano 
And like, oh, I, I mean, I, I would totally have been okay if you guys had decided to pull it, though, on the basis that there was some concerns about the publisher. No, and I mean, I don't think anyone, as far as I know, anyone actually like on the creative team for this book is above board. They don't hold me to that because I didn't research it extensively. <laughs> but like, I think especially the way the comics internet is blowing up recently, like if we, I don't know, if we wouldn't be able to talk about any comics currently. <laughs> yeah, I feel like 2020 is the year of the death of the author, like with J.K. Rowling spouting all of her oh. notes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Like, gosh. You got to start making decisions about do you separate the author from their works and how does it feel for you? I haven't had. And also, do you separate the publisher? Do you separate the publisher from from the published work as well? Because right. in, uh, you know, in so many cases, uh, you know that uh, I mean, and uh, and I think I can kind of admire where an artist can kind of say, "Look, I don't like the people that I work with because I've just discovered that they are now doing this, this, and this, and this," and then they pull sort of they work from that area. But I also know there's probably a lot of people who for whom that's probably a bit of a luxury, especially in twenty twenty where work might become harder to to get get a hold of. Yeah. Yeah. And I know a lot of comics creators have been kind of going for a, a boycott dynamite stance as a result of this. But yeah, I did also like at some point work is work and work is hard to find right now. So I honestly don't know. And that's about all I want to talk about for that. I want to talk about fun comics for the rest of it. That's fair. That's <laughs> entirely fair. Yeah. All right. But you were talking about old Hardy boy mysteries. Yes. So like it's, let's look first of all at the, um, if we're going to talk about troublesome publishing. Um, and I don't think, I think that this is an, a very interesting thing. Edward Stratemeyer is obviously the, um, the shadowy figure behind uh, Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew, Bobsy Twins, Rover Boys, Tom Swift, and uh, probably a few others uh, that uh, aren't listed here. But essentially in the 1920s, he pioneered this publishing model of packaged books, where essentially um, they provide a, they use the word stable of authors uh, with just broad plot outlines and character details. And then those authors then turn in the completed books. And in doing so, it means that they can, um, I mean, the word churn probably isn't fair, but they can turn out uh, a very high volume of of books. Um, so for the Hardy Boys, I think they're up to somewhere in the the two, three hundred books, uh, you know, titles for the, for the detectives and things like that. And Edward Stratmeyer sort of pioneered this. 1927 was when the Hardy Boys came out. So they're 93 years old. Um, and Frank and Joe probably definitely would have died in World War II if they were real people. Um, and Nancy Drew, obviously, uh, in 1930, which was also the year of Edward Stratmeyer's death. Uh, so, you know, she's she's also uh, 90 years old uh, this year. So, um, you know, looking at it in that sort of that context, the the books that you sort of you read, I mean, the, the very early Hardy Boys that I would read um, – I think I have probably talked ad nauseum about how difficult it was to get books as a child. Uh, and one of the ways that we used to do it is we just buy big boxes of secondhand books and you'd sort of dig through that, hoping that there'd be something that you could read. And often I'd find sort of like the old Hardy Boys. And I think one of the ones that I had was The Mystery of the Broken Arrow, which, um, you know, they'd, they'd often go and they'd work on like work sites and they'd be going undercover and the mystery sort of revolved around stopping smugglers or somebody who is stealing water, which, um, you know, if you're reading it in like 1997, that might seem a little bit like, I, I don't understand how that can be a problem in this modern day. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess, did you guys read any of those sort of growing up? I don't think I did. I don't remember any, like I can boxcar children is what I'm drawing mm-hmm. to, but that's not the same Stratemeyer, like syndicate, Novels. Sure. What about you? Matt? I remember like distinctly one Nancy Drew cover, although I can't like tell you which one it was. Like I'm pretty sure she's running away through some haunted looking forest. I have no idea what the actual <laughs> title of the thing was, and I'm sure I'm describing one of fifty six possible Nancy Drew covers where she's running away through a haunted forest. I, I think that with the sort of the um the rise of Nancy Drew, the the, the haunted forest industry also did very well um out, out of that sort of that that zenith, if you will. <laughs> I think most of most of their stories, yeah, usually involved wooded or or isolated locations. So yeah. <laughs> 
I was never really a Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew person, and that's kind of surprising, honestly, given how much I like mysteries in general. And I wonder if it's because I kind of always had comic books to sort of fill that serialized storytelling gap. Like you, so in your email to me when you were picking the book, you kind of described how you would pick up one from like the 1930s and then one from like the 1980s and it could be weird just like the dissonance oh, between that absolutely yes and i'd love to cover that in a little bit more detail um just just the the the, the assertion that this is the darkest hardy boys is 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 very flawed <laughs> okay i was actually kind of hoping you would say that because this doesn't actually feel like the darkest hardy boys to be like no no it not even kind of feels <laughs> actually sort of like so the way you describe the packaged book industry where like basically they would hammer out the plot in what almost kind of sounds like Marvel style where Stanley would like give Steve Ditko a Spider-Man issue in like five paragraphs and Steve Ditko would turn it into 22 pages of comics. Like, yeah, it's, it kind of feels like what this book is to me where I think I just feel like this book could have pushed it a little bit further. Like if you gave someone the concept it's the Hardy Boys, but Noir and Nancy Drew is there. Like, this is the book you would get. And that's not, I don't know, like, that, it's fine. It was good. But, like, I feel like there was a little bit more of, like, a, a twist or a push to it that could have been there. So, Absolutely. Yes. And I think that that is, um, is really kind of demonstrative of uh, Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys in general, is that their mysteries were always just that one step away from being something truly like amazing but that th that step was never quite there and so in, in a way like as much as this is a, a reimagining in, in many ways it's also just sort of sticking to that formula that that has been established for those you know for that 90 odd years which now that you talk about it that way of like that's just the way these like these characters and these properties are i kind of love it now like i'm kind of into it <laughs> well this is very much in my opinion uh, my notes so my my elevator pitch for for this is it's a soft reboot of the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. So, you know, it it's um there's a few characters missing that are present in the books themselves. One notable absence that I'd love to talk about in a little bit. Um and it just, you know, it's a twisty detective tale featuring murder, drugs and crooked cops, but the, you know, ultimately that's um those those things those things are all present in existing Hardy Boy and Nancy Drew literature at just at varying sort of amounts and so what i guess that the, what i like about this one is it's probably the first one where there's just a lot of consistency in the characters across the entire book itself whereas i think with the packaged books and, and you know it's 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 a fair enough um kind of uh sort of area to find yourself in where i think that there can sometimes be a lot of inconsistency between those characters and that's just the the relationship of having multiple people working on it at any one time um, and I think that that's so, you know, if, if nothing else, this at least gives you a very consistent Nancy Drew, a very consistent Hardy Boys. Yeah, I was kind of wondering, like, describe sort of the like there's to me, there's sort of like an Ur Batman and an Ur Spider-Man, right? Where I've read a bunch exactly. of Batman comics across different universes and times and whatever. And like, I have this picture of Batman in my head. And this is like, you can tell when he says something out of character, right? Mm -hmm. Like. So mm -hmm. what is the Ur, the Ur Hardy Boys to you? Like, does this meet the criteria, uh, I guess? So it's always, uh, so you've always got Frank is the, uh, is the elder, older brother and therefore the wiser brother, um, you know, much more prone to uh, look before you leap. And Joe is always the much more impulsive one. Um, and that, I think, um, that holds true throughout the entire Hardy Boys um, universe. And I mean, there's been multiple reimaginings of their adventures. Um, uh, specifically, the, the big one was the Case Files that launched in 1987, uh, which took a much darker kind of look at these at the adventures that they go on. And I guess the Ur Nancy Drew is the Nancy Drew whose mother passed away when she was very young, and um, you know she slowly started getting involved in solving mysteries. And she's always sharp as a tack. She's always thinking two steps ahead of of everyone else, um, but never in a way that kind of rubs it in people's faces. So I guess you know. It, Inoffensive is probably also like a key um, part of their their characters. Um, you know that they 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 might be the smartest people in the room in the books, but they don't tend to sort of like show off or grandstand, which is perhaps the, the biggest departure in the comic book itself when they are sort of speaking with the police. I think the the um, in the first chapter, there's just that that line of um, Frank, Frank, Frank. 
This isn't some sort of little teen adventure before the policeman slams Frank's head into the table. Before the book um, literally hits you over the head with what it's going to be. <laughs> exactly, yes. And I mean, that certainly was different because uh, I think in all of the Hardy Boys, books uh, and i'm probably misremembering it but they tend to have a fairly good relationship with the police um and so i would say that um having their father be ostensibly a crooked cop and having the police against them is is a fairly big departure and potentially if they explore that in the follow-ups i'll be very interested to see how that turns out yeah i feel like so i was thinking about it while i was writing up my notes and i feel like the first issue is actually the best issue of this book because it sets up a lot of things that actually are promising and then i feel like a lot of it kind of spins off and doesn't like doesn't actually connect or follow up properly yeah yeah i guess uh, what's a good way of putting this it's it's kind of like in parks and recreation uh the tv show where even when there's somebody who's a bad guy they usually turn out to be okay um, you know, they turn out to be at least good people um, deep down. And I think that that kind of encapsulates some of the stuff that happens in this book where you've got drug dealing um, people whose brother gets murdered. And rather than kind of like taking that to a, a darker place where potentially they turn on the Hardy Boys and NCG, instead they're like, no, you're right. We need to work with you to solve this case. And you're kind of like, is that is that what you do? I could not buy the fact that they had that meeting with their quote unquote suppliers. The the meeting went sour, and they didn't instantly suspect the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. Yes, of exactly the <laughs> only <laughs> the only strangers that they'd introduced to this deal. Obviously, was our brother. He's the only other person who knows about this. Teen detective. No, he's dead. Right there. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so the Rover Boys were certainly an interesting example of that kind of. Um, that that sort of that that trope of just like um, good boys doing slightly bad naughty things, if if anything. I mean, these guys were actively fixing card games and smuggling drugs into Bayport. I mean, they should be in jail by the end of this. Yeah, but um, you know, I guess that kind of fits with the whole um, you know, you you don't get to pick your allies when you can't trust the cops anymore. So, Pat, how did you find this book as a person? Yeah, sorry, Pat, have... we've been completely known. I have been enjoying it. It's fine. I feel like Jono has the upper hand in this and the fact that he has all the background and like recognizes the cameos when they show up because I feel like a large portion of this comic is, oh, look, it's those characters that I recognize yes. and like the big twist at the end that the big shadowy evil thing that's controlling all these villains is the that was So I actually didn't catch that until I read it the second time and I read the introduction and there's that paragraph at the bottom of the introduction that's like, thanks to all the syndicate writers. And I was like, oh, <laughs> it's a very big in joke. <laughs> so I feel like a good portion of it is lost on people like me who recognizes the names of the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, but like not the characters and like if they did differ drastically from what they were in the books, I wouldn't know. I know them from like you were saying South Park or uh, um, like we were talking about earlier, the Venture Bros <laughs> making fun of them with the with the uh, twins and that. That was one, a, that so. was such a good one. <laughs> but but I think it is interesting. So the the Rover Boys, Tom Swift and the Bobsy twins don't to my knowledge actually show up in any Hardy Boys books. They were just um, they were just okay. um, titles that Edward Stratmire was also publishing, so that that's just a neat little kind of um, neat little side thing. But they're not actually in any of the books that I know of, um, or or appearing in mm. any of them. But but you're right. I mean, still things like um, Fenton Hardy, um, you know, uh, uh, Nancy Drew's father, uh, Carlton Drew, and that sort of stuff. I think that you know, again, like the book does assume a bit of familiarity with them. Like I think that they may be targeting it at people who fell off reading Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys when they became teenagers and are now potentially picking this book up when they're slightly older. Oh, it's definitely a nostalgia mm -hmm. play, right? Like, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a, hey, you enjoyed these, but you want to read something that's, I guess, quote-unquote adult. Like, here's this book. Yeah. Which, I mean, absolutely reasonable. Yeah. Well, they're cashing in the same thing that Riverdale is in Sabrina now is as well. Yeah, yeah and Nancy Drew has their own TV series. Oh, that's right. I always forget that. <laughs> Wait, who does? Nancy Man. Drew. Yeah. Does she have a TV series now? What? Yeah, currently active. Um, Is that and a the Hardy Boys. Thing? Yeah, I think so. The Hardy Boys had a TV series, but that was like in the seventies, and it looks like it was in the seventies. Like I think the Hardy Boys looked like they were forty. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, it's a CW show. Why am I not surprised at all? <laughs> 
I mean, if it's going to be on a channel, it's going to be on the CW, it's be CW. Right? <laughs> Also, I think Susie's going to be disappointed because this is the closest we're going to get to the Riverdale <laughs> podcast that she was talking about. <laughs> but they they meant they do mention Archie in the introduction about how um uh look, I'm I'm not judging the people who made this book because I did enjoy it. And and you know, it's it, but it's enjoyment in the same way that like you know, I, I might enjoy fast food or something like that. That's not to say it's bad. It's just that um, I think that they perhaps thought that they were doing things with these characters that hadn't been done before. Um, so uh, having Nancy Drew and the two Hardy boys face a real-life crime story, turning the old, all-age cases, mystery cases, into a noir thriller. Whereas, um, so 1987, uh, they released uh, Dead on Target. And I will say, spoiler warning, again, for anybody that's waiting on it, Dead on Target. Uh, the beginning of the book starts with Joe's girlfriend, Iola Morton, being killed by a car bomb. Holy um, moly. Exactly. And the Hardy Boys begin investigating and they uncover there's a government network, a uh, government agency called The Network. Um, and they work with somebody called The Grey Man, who tells them that this is all the work of the assassins. Several assassins die through the course of the book, uh, including the one responsible for the car bomb. And that launches um, the case files uh, that ran for 10 years, 11 years, 127 books published. So what you're um, telling me is this is not even the hardest that the Hardy Boys have gone. <laughs> not no, like no, so the, the case files was fascinating. And, and I, I really want to talk about The Big Lie, but I think um, I need to mention some of these books from <laughs> the case files. In one of the books, they infiltrate a survival camp where one of their friends went missing. Uh, and they find out it's actually a training center for a militia. Um, and the people that don't pass get hunted for sport. And they end up being what? hunted for sport. And that's just that's just like one of the books. Um, <laughs> uh, so there's very loose kind of continuity throughout that, that thing. And the KGB pops up, the CIA, all kinds of things like that. So it's, it, you know, kind of it's very interesting. Um, you know, I, I, I still think that, again, there's probably more consistency in the big lie. But the case files was a very interesting kind of time for that because they really did that the Hardy boys would use guns and they would they'd kill they were sort of um yeah so I'd say the series has had uh, many flirtations with a more serious kind of side um and I don't know that the big lie is the most serious it's ever been it doesn't look like it so I went to Wikipedia <laughs> and I looked up the dead on target yep story because I just wanted to know and like I'm looking at this cover where a car is exploding, like the car bomb is yep. happening on it. Yep. And the second paragraph of the plot summary starts with the sentence, Joe vows to kill them. Yeah. Like, <laughs> he can't drink coffee at this one. <laughs> I mean, they don't, I don't think, to my knowledge, they don't swear at all in this graphic novel. Uh, and they, don't, they certainly don't swear in the case files, but they do vow to murder uh, the people responsible for the car bomb. So, yeah. Um, sort of ton tonally, it's it's a it's an interesting one. That is super wild, Jono. I'm so glad that <laughs> we picked this book just so I could like <laughs> learn about all this Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew knowledge. Well, the case files actually did lead to the first team up of Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys, which I need to check my dates, but I'm pretty sure was in 1998. Uh, da -da -da -da. So 127 books in the case files. And then Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys Super Mystery Series, which was 1988 to 1998. So that was 36 volume series of paperbacks as well. Uh, and then those continued uh, for many years. Um, most recently, they actually had a 2012 set that got um, eventually got covered, uh, cancelled. But I mean, you know, it's sort of, uh, I think that that's kind of where we're coming from in terms of background to Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys. There's, there's, um, it's it's very much like as you said it's very much like the uh, Batman the uh, Spider Man uh, whichever version you've read is the real one to you and so for many people discovering the Big Lie that's not to say that these characters aren't Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys at all um, it's just it's a it's an interesting way to reintroduce these characters and potentially even hook new readers in yeah I'm still processing now that they go hunting like basically Al Qaeda <laughs> assassins after their, one of their girlfriends car bomb. I'm like I'm still getting over that so it's gonna take me a second to want to talk about this book again <laughs> that's fair yeah that would be an interesting comic book that would be something that's mm. for sure but yeah so this I, book, we read this one <laughs> Matt, did you like any of the characters in this comic book? I liked 
I liked Nancy. I think that might be it. Uh, you could argue me into liking the Hardy Boys, I think. Well, Nancy was clever, but I I didn't have any warmth towards any of these characters. Uh, clever gets yeah. you pretty far with me. So, I mean, like, mm. you're not wrong. <laughs> I'll give you that. They did feel very smug. Um uh, and and again, I think um, Matt, you made the great point that the first issue is probably the best issue as well. Um, when they talk about postcard days and how you know the, their postcard days were when everything seemed perfect, but all it took was their dad being accused of a crime, and suddenly they're on the other side of it. And then you have to wonder how many people they accused of crimes um, as teenage detectives who didn't really answer to anyone. Um, and how many people had the same experience that they had after a run-in with the Hardy Boys? Yeah, they are. They like always have essentially been vigilantes, regardless, right? Like, absolutely, yeah. But like, I don't. As far as your your question, Pat, of like, did I? Li- I think part of it is that I don't. There are actually a lot of characters in this book, wildly, or like as mm-hmm. short as it is. So like, I don't really get to know anyone outside of Nancy and the Hardy Boys, like. So if yeah. you don't like them, then I'm pretty, like, I'm kind of running into a problem, right? So if you don't like Nancy and the Hardy Boys, Pat, you might have a problem. Did you have a problem? Well, I, I mean, it's not a problem. It just made it much more bland for me than I think if you came in with a relationship with Nancy and the Hardy Boys going into this. You know, it, I'm starting from square one, and, and this book doesn't paint them in a very appealing manner. I can completely understand. And I think um, I agree with you. It, it is um, even even knowing what I know about the the characters are still very bland um, in comparison, I guess, to to what I've known of them in the past. Sure. Uh, and so I certainly well, agree. Sounds a bit <laughs> I think like I both appreciate and don't appreciate the fact that the the Hardys are kind of like on the outs throughout most of this book. Like, I think it's an interesting choice but i also think it breaks up the dynamic of what makes them them and i guess jano you would know better than me on that i i mean certainly um it's it's a new direction for them especially as um i don't think it's too much of a leap to suggest that their father actually was a crooked cop from the sounds of things like it it sounds like he was being blackmailed by the syndicate yeah it wasn't actually clear on that at the end whether he yeah. was innocent or wasn't so in previous books, I mean, he's he's sometimes sort of like a paternal figure and sometimes he's very much an absent father for them. Um, so he's never really featured that prominently and the mother gets about as much um, screen time in the books as she does in the comic. Um, you know, very much a, a, a figure of uh, motherly affection when they want it and then when she's de- dealing with her own issues that largely forgotten. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, th- I think that that's, that, that, that pretty much all adds up, but I think it's, it's, um, certainly to me, it seemed like their father definitely was a crooked cop and that that was having severe, um, impacts on their lives, but it was never sort of in the sense of like, um, you know, what does this mean for us in terms of what our father taught us and stuff? And it was always just kind of like, oh, this is really annoying. Our girlfriend's done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sort of. Right. I think that's kind of. That might be what kind of puts me off the back chapters of the book is that it very quickly turns into a generic mystery when it should be super personal to them, right? Like, it doesn't feel like they're as invested in figuring out what happened to their dad as they're just solving whatever generic Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew mystery of the week happened. Exactly. And it all seems to stem from the clock room in the first issue um, when they are at the, the, the Bobsy Twins party. They step into the clock room to talk to each other and Nancy steps out of the clock. And mm-hmm. I think she says something to them there and we're kind of left on the hook as to what that is, but it's never really kind of, I mean, you know, she sort of hints it that the scheme was for the boys to become, uh, I mean, they were already pariahs, so I'm not quite sure how much more of a pariah she expected them to become, but that was sort of the the expectation that, she w- that, they, that they would become on the other side of the law so the police wouldn't be looking at them or would be looking at them so then they could investigate the crooked cops, I guess. But I think because we don't really get to see that side of things, it's always kind of left a little bit up in the air. And she would have known that their father was going to die then? Yeah, that's where I got hung up too. Like <laughs> by issue, I think it was like issue two or three. I was like, wait, man. Oh no, it was issue two. Cause she was like, oh, did you guys get them to think that you murdered your dad? I was like, wait, he wasn't dead though. When you guys were meeting 
Exactly. So what, do you, what do you know and when did you find it out? <laughs> so maybe the, the logical conclusion then is that Nancy is actually the syndicate. The leader of the syndicate? Yeah. Yeah. Oh that would change God. things. I would, I would read that. But yeah. I don't think that that's the direction that they're going in. Um, Probably I think not, though. It is, it is a very boiled down kind of detective story. You know, it's kind of distilled. Um, at one stage, I think some of the press mentions uh, Nancy Drew as the femme fatale in this noir noir thriller but is she a femme fatale no i mean is that is that the, no that that trope if anyone, is, if apply. anyone is the protagonist of this book it's nancy drew because like the hardy exactly. boys their captions i can't even tell them apart sometimes <laughs> because of the way that they're like <laughs> they're just generically one color or the other but like yes. i can i can tell when nancy's talking for sure every single time so, like, if anyone is the star of this book, it actually is Nancy Drew. So I don't think she's the femme fatale. No. Well, I, she gets uh, top billing anyways, right? Exactly. Which is another thing, too. So, like, the cliffhanger of the first issue is that Nancy Drew shows up. Her name is first on the cover. It's it's not exactly a cliffhanger, no. <laughs> well, okay, so now that we've kind of talked about how bland the characters can come across, I think it's time to discuss the character that wasn't in the books. Uh, that wasn't in sure. this book particularly, and I think that it's it's very interesting that you guys picked up on the lack of warmth from them because one of the characters that is famous um, in in the sort of the Hardy Boys universe is Chet Morgan, uh, Chet Morton, sorry, uh, Chet Morton. Uh, he's the fat comic relief character, um, although um, that seems to be the sort of like on the the surface the trope. But he's also very much the sort of the heart of the group. He's always willing to help them with their schemes. Even though he's a bit cowardly, he'll he'll find his courage and he'll help them and stuff. And, you know, consistently they've sort of said that, you know, that this is one of the, the redeeming qualities of the Hardy Boys books is that they've got this character who otherwise might be ridiculed and yet that he's still equally worthy of friendship and he's equally brave and he's equally willing to put himself at risk even though he doesn't necessarily have the natural gifts that the Hardy Boys have. Uh, and so his absence in this book, in in many ways, almost undermines it because he he sort of is always um, kind of uh, sort of like I said, he's he's very much considered to be the heart uh, in in these sorts of uh, weird Captain Planet analogies. Um, <laughs> and so so his absence, I think, in many ways, does undermine uh, being able to connect with the Hardy Boys because the only other character that they interact with on sort of a, a social level without beating them with clubs or anything like that is Tom Swift. And he, do, he doesn't even get any he likes. Doesn't speak. Yeah. What he is just, up with that? He's a hacker. Yeah. Just a hacker. That's what I know. Yeah. And he's a person of color. So at least they can say they've included a person of color. Yeah. Um, it's a bad look, right? Like it, it's not great. No. Um, I mean, I respect that. It's kind of a nod to the fact that Tom Swift is also a series that Edward Stratmire published, but that's probably like, you can probably do both of those things. Like it yeah, also sure, give him lines like, and yeah. The Rovers get agency. to talk. Are they a, a series or are they just other characters in the books? No, Rover Boys are also a, a series by Ebert Stratmire. Um, I okay. don't recall. They were the first series, actually. Yeah, no, correct. According to Wikipedia. Oh. No, well, that makes sense that they're older then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do think I liked their brother, Sam. I think if I had to pick a character that I actually did like, it was probably Sam. And I think he he came across like as, as at least more more than two-dimensional because he was a little bit tragic um you know he's hiding from his brothers he's obviously not having the best of times and he is then ruthlessly exploited by nancy drew and the hardy boys in See, the pursuit of their own like, my deal with sam is like i did kind of like him but i un also didn't understand why he was helping them because they they're the ones who screwed him over <laughs> time and again yes <laughs> So yeah, I think again, like it, it, he he came across very much as a tragic figure who um, was used by both sides of whatever was going on. Maybe he was the femme fatale. Is that is that is can Sam. we justify that? <laughs> I don't think so because the Hardy Boys yeah. don't try to court him. Like I kind of get what they're okay. saying about Nancy being the femme fatale, but like I think that strips a lot of the agency of the character when she's the one who's driving most of the book actually absolutely yeah i did like the bit where you sort of see her sitting with her dad sitting with her dad then she hacks her mom's email account and then that's a that's obviously quite a defining moment because in in the books nancy is always best pals with her father and so there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of there's a lot of kind of um i guess and i mean you know the, it makes sense but there's a lot of kind of references to kind of legacy 
in many ways. You know, the legacy of being sons of this famous policeman who turns out to be crooked, the legacy of being this daughter who then finds out, um, you know, that your father, who's this supposed to be this shining example of justice, is is uh, potentially anything but. Um, and so I, I guess that the book kind of flirts with that, but it doesn't commit enough to be interesting in those ways. Yeah, it doesn't go full force on it. It definitely no. is there, like you were saying, but it definitely is. It's a background element, and it's not the thing that kind of brings the whole book together. Yeah. Um, and also, question. Okay, so one of the both of the cops that interview them run in the beginning are crooked right they are 100 percent responsible for the death of fenton hardy is that is that everybody's read at least the the incompetent one is the incompetent one okay so that, that makes sense because later on in that same issue the two cops talk about it and they talk about um uh where is it it doesn't sit right we don't have anything on them can't hold them i don't get it brothers best friends inseparable now they want to get into a ring and punch each other's brains out and um, surely the cops would know because they're the ones that committed the crime? Yeah, that conversation doesn't make sense. I actually have like a whole <laughs> half page of stuff that's like, wait, if you actually read this, like this does not line oh, up. Oh, please, please run through that with us, Matt. <laughs> oh my god, let's see. I mean, I'm a little bit scattered throughout the notes, but like the fact that they even brought the Hardy Boys in when they have the gun and it has fingerprints on it, like they why like and yes. so <laughs> and so then carson drew is apparently the oh no is not the person who did it they faked his fingerprints on it why if he's part of the syndicate <laughs> like what are they do i don't know exactly it's just like, what what has happened what what was this inciting incident for them to kill fenton and then frame carson that that's an that's an interesting thing like that's what i want to know the answer to but i don't feel that we get that at all in this book and i and potentially in the sequel they'll explore that but that's sort of um that's that's to be decided so i think part of what happened is so i read i think that interview you had sent over actually from polygon jano when you mm -hmm. were like oh hey like they just started releasing the sequel to this book let's read nancy drew hardy boy's big lie and i yeah. think the writer initially had it like as one 12 issue story and then dynamite broke it up so I think uh, maybe we would have gotten like maybe the story would have been paced differently or outlined differently or something if we'd gotten it as like the whole twelve issue thing. See now that is much more classic Hardy Boys when the publisher would just kind of like scrap interesting storylines <laughs> into Say, favor. Oh no, of just actually this, this is a six issue miniseries. <laughs> you must <laughs> think it's right. I mean, but it kind of <laughs> does feel like that, right? Which is I don't know. It's super interesting that um, even this weird comics version of these two properties kind of like has to fit the constraints that they've been fitting into since like the thirties or whatever. Exactly. No. And I, and I think that that is actually a really good observation. I'd say that, 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 that if nothing else, the writer has managed to capture that aspect of it um, to a, to a T. So I don't think we've talked much about the art in this. So I guess I want, before we get like too specific on it, what were your guys's general thoughts? Like, did you enjoy it? Did you not enjoy it? Why? It was all right. <laughs> yeah, you always have such strong opinions. I'm too, uh, It wasn't my favorite. And it hurts me because I did, as you say, poke my nose in your notes before we started. It's okay. I, I appreciate the fact that it does have an older style to it, which fits the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. And it obviously has the deep shadows of a noir story. But it's a little too loose for me, and I get a little confused about who's talking and what's going on occasionally. It gets a little too gloomy at times. So, you know, Kat actually said the exact same thing about the art, that it was too loose to her. And I disagree, but, like, the fact that both of you brought it up obviously means it's a, a valid criticism at that point. So, you were not alone, I, Pat. <laughs> I can definitely yeah. see where you're coming from there. Yeah. Well, I did like the art. Um, I particularly liked the flashback panels and how they, um, the sort of the kind of almost grainy filter that goes over it. Um, I would say probably the art was serviceable in terms of the story that they were that they were giving. And again, I think that that's not meant to be a a, a dig at the art at all. I, I like it, but I think serviceable is probably again what they aim for with Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's never supposed to be something that's a masterpiece. It's always supposed to be in service of the publisher. 
So uh, see, I really liked the art. Like I would I would go much higher than you guys on the did I dig the art scale, I think. Like you guys are maybe I would go like very a- high for, I would go very high for the covers. I think the covers were actually pretty cool. I thought that those were very clever. Um clever uses of like um just the front page cover of Nancy Drew's silhouette with um, the eye, the eyes being the lights for the police station. I thought that was very yes, cool. Yes, that's very cool. Yeah, that like was that. very cool. And again, that sort of fits with Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys. The the cover art was always meant to, to <laughs> really draw you in. <laughs> <laughs> it all comes back to it. <laughs> <laughs> but what did you like about the art, Matt? I just I really like the atmosphere of it. So the fact that it's a little bit loose, I didn't mind because I thought that worked sort of in service of the like the story and it being a little bit grittier and a little bit less mm-hmm. defined black and white, whatever for these characters. Mm-hmm. Um, I really enjoyed the colors, especially on the pages where um, people are like getting hit or shot. <laughs> like yes. I feel the pages, like the page where college colleague slams Frank's head into the desk. Like you feel that. Right. And that's a really big, yeah. like it's a combination between the line work, the colors and the letters like there's really great like impactful sound effects in here too Mm -hmm. definitely can see that yeah and and like you said there's there's that great panel of him getting his head slammed into the desk and then he's sort of sitting there looking at the desk and then he thinks back to how things used to be and and it goes much to a much more sort of uh you know the colors uh uh sort of dulled which is you know like the same for memory and things like that so you know it is yeah it's it in in service of that it's really well yeah, and like there's the scene I think where um colleague is in the sewers too in that page where he's just got like the flashlight and that looks very painterly. I really enjoyed that page. Mm-hmm. Um and then the one where the Hardies are like beating each other up, like I also really felt those punches, I think. Um and again, that's kind of a combination between the line work and the colors and the like the the shadow the shadow work on the inks is really cool. So I really dug it, but I could also see where, like, it it is, like, loose in a couple spots, especially, like, issue, I think it's issue five, where Joe is kind of, like, hanging out with Tom Swift and running through the the market, play, the farmer's market or whatever, like, that gets a little bit loose, even for me. Like, there are some very indistinct characters in those pages, but. Mm. Um, now question about that scene the poor barrel of pickles yes <laughs> such a waste of pickles such a waste of pickles the farmer's market yeah. mainstay the barrel of pickles a question about that scene though um a flip phone so that's colleague's big um drawback is apparently he doesn't understand technology um and then they use the flip phone to lure his his uh, contact in right and the reason that they're able to do that is because they're able to hack the gps on the flip phone the flip phone now, do old style flip phones? Did they used to use GPS? I don't actually know the answer. We'll have to look it up for the show notes. I want to say no, because yeah. I don't remember it being a big thing. I don't remember it being a big thing. We got the smartphones, but I'm gonna make a note. I'm gonna look it up for the show notes. Hang on. <laughs> and that feels look. That feels a little unfair because I'm really sort of um, picking at. No, I mean at I'm that point in- we're going deep, right? But. <laughs> But, I mean, you know, in most detective stories, there'll be that sort of moment where there'll be that plot device that lets them get away. But it seems like with Tom Swift, they get a few passes because Tom knows how to also shut down the router in a police station and things like that. He can do anything except speak, John. <laughs> <laughs> That's his one weakness. <laughs> so my bigger issue with that particular thing where they use colleagues' phone to talk to their contact and set up a meeting Mm-hmm. This is the biggest plot hole in the entire thing, I think, actually. Like, you could drive a truck through this one. Somehow, Joe's meeting with colleagues' contact and Nancy and Frank's meeting with the um, rover supplier yep. happens at the same place on the same night as with the same person, and that person suspects nothing. <laughs> like, what? Yeah, that person doesn't just, like, I mean, that's, if, if nothing else. As a, as a, a um, district attorney and things like that, Carson should have a really good handle on time management, and he should know better than to schedule me- meetings at the same time. Same time. The only yeah. way it works, I guess, and this is a lot of credit, but maybe it's the thing, is like whoever they actually sent the thing to sent a, me- a, se- like a second separate meeting thing to Carson, 
and he mm-hmm. wasn't even like he wasn't even the person they actually all talked to. They all just got like shell gamed there. Like that's well, the that, only I mean that that, makes that does sense. make sense. Is then Car- Carson is then shot at that point. Um, so it does make sense that it was a setup for Carson. But we're not. I mean, all we're given is that he's shot. We're not actually given any of that kind of background to the shell game. I mean, a lot of that is you have to fill in those blanks. But he, I mean, certainly Carson was being set up um, because he he is that they, they attempt to murder him on the spot. Uh, the the syndicate, I presume. I'm I'm guessing it's the syndicate who yeah. who attempt to do that there. Yeah. Possibly one of the cops, although we don't really ever find out. Maybe we'll find <laughs> out in the sequel. <laughs> but it also seems like they should have got the FBI involved a lot sooner. Because the you FBI think, show up right? and immediately arrest the crooked cops. Right. The cute ending where it's the syndicate is good, but at the same time, it robs the story of an actual villain. Yeah, like this, that I can, this story does not conclude. No. Like it's, oh, these cops did it, but they did it because someone else told them to do it, and we don't know why and who. This is very unsatisfactory. So, like, <laughs> John, did the novels do that at all? Like, I would just imagine, um, especially like maybe the later '80s ones, like where they knew they were going in sequence, kind of even, as opposed to being sort of the more one and done. So, look, look I'm I'm really having to cast my mind back a long time, but I know for <laughs> a fact that the the early books. This is not the Hardy Boys case files, but the early books, the Hardy Boys mysteries. Um, they would always have a satisfying conclusion. You know, the boys would always solve the mystery and then they go on and have, you know, they go out to dinner with the family, um, which seemed to be the only reward they'd often get, which, um, yeah, child labor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but with the case files, uh, there was they, there was often a satisfying conclusion, but it would also often hint at that there was more to come. Which I think I can I can stomach that if if as long as the current thread gets tied up I don't mind there being that you know it's it's almost that a plot b plot c plot approach to storytelling where there's that there's that longer running c plot that um you know this this organization that they were up against was called the assassins um and uh you know Joe obviously was uh, vowed to kill the the people responsible so he doesn't get to kill them in every single book but there's <laughs> there's often at least hints that they're related to it. <laughs> That There's is often, you know, sort of like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, um, from memory, for example, when they infiltrate the survival camp, um, and it turns out that it's actually some sort of training thing for militia. I'm not a hundred percent sure because it's been a decade since I've read that book, but I'm fairly certain that, 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 that camp is then linked to being involved in some way with the assassins. And so, you know, that that's kind of like the conclusion is they've solved that mystery. They saved their friend. I think they killed the guy that was hunting them, or at least, you know, in, in, incapacitate him in some way. The police arrive, um, are able to break the whole thing up and, and, you know, satisfactorily. And then there might just be a hint that, you know, oh, well, you know, you know, you've managed to stop a recruitment center for the assassins. Uh, and so the assassins were always sort of like hovering at the, at the very edge of the, of the story. And, and I guess if that's going to be the way for the syndicate to find, but like Pat, Pat, I think you said very well, it, it robs this particular story of any kind of um, feeling of gain. Yeah, and I'm, I'm re-reading the last few pages of it, and I guess Nan Bobsey is part of the syndicate, and so is the Lobster Shack owner. Yes, yeah. that, that was an interesting little um, sort of nod at the, right at the end, as he was also the one that helped the Hardy Boys meet with Nancy Drew in the, in the first... Right, yeah. In the first, which... The, these are all great things to do, but it didn't feel like there was any payoff um, for this particular book. Yeah, I wonder if, so like the failure isn't the syndicate setup, because that's actually kind of intriguing. Like if I'm going to read the second one, that's probably what gets me into it. Right. But I think the failure is that the, like we still don't really understand the motivations behind why the hard no, this- dad had to die. And like, that's what this book was supposed to be about. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Like if you actually look at it, this book nothing really happens. <laughs> like exactly, thing, like they learn they learn how to do card tricks and stuff for one scene, and then that's gone. <laughs> they hack into the police office for a gun that then is then like stolen from the guy. I don't. It's like they do things that don't prove to mean anything, and the and the plot progresses slightly because of it. I th- I think that's entirely fair a fair reading of of what's happened. Yeah. And I mean, if this is all in service, uh, like you said, Matt, if this is all to set up that 12, if this is supposed to be a 12 issue and, that you know, maybe some stuff got truncated, 
that's understandable. But the fact is they do have a sequel in mind. So, you know, it mm -hmm. will stuff be resolved then. Um, there's a hint in that final panel in that final page. Sorry. Uh, uh, mom, my mom used to think that postcard towns like Bayport were boring. I always disagreed with her. I told you if you put a postcard under a magnifying glass, prizes, that then goes on to reveal um, the Bobsy Twins sending a message to the Lobster Shack owner. So I wonder if I go back and look at the panels where those characters appear, will I see something that hints at something else? Or is that... Oh, they're telling you to actually put credit? the pages underneath them. My... <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> or is that giving it way too much credit? I think it's the second <laughs> bit. <but laughs> maybe. I would really... I would hope it was true because it'd be awesome but i doubt it uh yeah i um, I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna have to get back to you on that one <laughs> <laughs> but look yeah, i think it's... overall in terms of it being um if this is a soft reboot of this and this is going to be something that they commit to publishing more of i'm not i'm not against it i think i like i liked it enough that i would read the next one um you know i think that the it, I, 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 this sounds like a really backhanded compliment, but it, you know, I feel like everything was very serviceable in terms of what they were aiming for. I mean, yes, definitely the plot uh, has uh, an unsatisfying conclusion in that it, it potentially sets up a wider thing, um, and mm -hmm. that they don't really get any kind of resolution. But at least I would I would consider continuing to read it as a result of um, the kind of the setup that they've done. But I get the impression, potentially, Pat, that that isn't something that you would uh, you would agree with. It, it purely uh, on the basis that potentially the characters didn't uh, endear themselves to you. There wasn't really anything in the story that felt new. Like I've For seen sure. this story play out many times in many mm -hmm. me different media, so I don't know if there's enough to get me to get the next six issue to I'd... find out who the syndicate is and who's involved. And if Tom Swift gets lines in the next six, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I like. So we always ask that question, right? Of like, would you like? Would you read the next one, or would you recommend this to someone? And I think where I came down on with like, would you read the next one? Is I would read it. I pro like if it was in a library. Like I think that's mm -hmm. where I'm at. Like that's I'm fair. curious yeah. to see what happens. Like if it's on a comicsology sale for like five dollars or something like i might pick it up if i find it in the library i'll grab it and i'll be excited to grab it because i kind of want to mm -hmm. see like if the threads come back around and there actually is like a satisfying conclusion or like even a motive for fenton hardy being killed because i still don't really understand why he was killed and i think that's oh, the big failure absolutely yeah so like i would i would pick it up but i don't think i'm gonna go out of my way for it Oh, I think that, and I think that's entirely fair. Yeah, um, I think both of both of your reasonings are, are like, yeah, they make perfect sense. Like, this is um, this builds itself very much as the darkest that the series has ever gotten, and I think as we've discussed, it sort of uh, fell maybe a little bit short of of where we've previously seen them. I'm kind of wildly like I was already sort of at oh, okay well like the book gave you exactly what if the nancy or what if what if the nancy boys and hardy drew <laughs> 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 like what if it was them but things were serious like i was like yeah i gave you that but it was kind of like fine it's still within the parameters of that concept nothing really it was safe it was really safe it wasn't blowing girlfriends up in cars and hunting humans well, that's the thing right is like <laughs> not only did i find out that you guys agreed, but also I found out that other writers have done wildly less safe things. <laughs> so, like, I want to see those things. So, one thing I think that um, I think bears mentioning, just because we sort of touched on representation, um, it, I talked about Chet Morton um, in in sort of he he was sort of like the heart of the of the Hardy Boys, so to speak. There was also a lot of kind of um, and and I mean, this is one of those kinds of things of you know, it's either there or it's not for you. But, you know, in, in doing my research on it, there was apparently a lot of sly nods to um, LGBTIQ+, um, in terms of Chet Morton and his his kind of lifestyle. Um, and I, I was actually quite fond of this because um, it was Leslie McFarlane who wrote many of the series originals. She um, They would always emphasize Chet Morton had great pride in his old jalopy, the Queen. Uh, and that was always <laughs> like a, a very subtle kind of nod. And I think that that kind of subtlety is something that um, I can admire, even if it's, you know, even if it was really subtle for the time and it doesn't really kind of, and I think that this book doesn't have any of that subtlety. No, um, not so you much. Know, if we're, no. If we're looking at kind of like very sly nods and things like that, 
this book either telegraphs it or mm-hmm. we're reading way too much into something that isn't there at all. So like the page that sums up the book for me actually is this the page where they're talking to Sam and Sam's kind of like detailing the Rover Brothers like criminal empire. Mm-hmm. So the composition of the page is interesting to me. Like it's got like one of the big inset middle panels with um, the Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew and Sam in it. It's got the criminal empire like drawn out with a sharpie or whatever sort of but like it's Mm -hmm. facing me the reader and it's got those surrounding panels like the page layout is actually interesting and like i I enjoy looking at the art and then like i look at the criminal empire of the rovers and it's like the word goons is in there like what (laughs) like it's it's so straightforward and just kind of like exactly what you would like expect in a in a like there is none of the like there's none of the subtle stuff like it says the word goons if if somebody Multiple put, times. if somebody put that kind of flow chart up at work i would assume they were having like a stroke because there's just like <laughs> the word there's just the word me circled and then online on either side and i mean like i i guess it's you know so you kind of have to right like yes <laughs> what does that even Ugh. i'm online twice and then cops, question mark, yeah. question mark, question mark. Yeah. Goons, businesses, bling. Sorry, no, the, the order of importance is bling, goons, businesses. I think that's supposed to be gambling and it's cut gambling. off by the other that panel. makes sense. But, I mean, <laughs> no, bling. Bling, I like bling. Bling is also good, though. Like, the goons need it works. bling and they give it to the businesses. And goons, muscle, and cops, again, as the... Cops? Like, question cops? Mark, question mark, question like the cops aren't connected to any of the other bits. No. Like it just I mean, maybe it's just how little Sam knows. I mean that's also fair. Yeah, but again, and, that's I mean, maybe that is like Sam's fair. genuine reading of the business, and that's why his brothers keep him out of it. Yeah, because he has no idea. But yeah, I think that sort of like sums the book up to me is like that page looks cool, but when you get like when you look at it deeply, you're kinda like, oh okay. This is fine. Well, I didn't know what that page was, like, the weird panels on the other side. Like, is that them finding out about the organization or Sam telling them what the organization is? So I think the panels on the side are, like, them getting to know the girlfriends and, like, roughing up the people who owe the rovers money, which seems like a pretty big, I don't know, like a pretty big... That, um, that, that seems like a pretty big departure for the Hardy Boys acting as strong arms for um, a local sort of organized crime. Well, also, like, uh, but it's no okay one because there's only one to. panel and that's all we get told. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know exactly what they were trying to convey with that panel. I mean, I hate just to... took it in and then turned the page. I, I mean, to bring in like other outside media, there is an episode of um, of Rick and Morty. Uh, I think it's <laughs> Look Who's Purging Now. Um, and at the very <laughs> at the very end of it, um, you know, uh, where this character is lamenting the fact that they have gone on a murderous rampage. Uh, and then they sort of go, oh, no, it's okay. The the thing that you ate earlier, it completely explains your earlier behavior. So, you you know, you can you can continue with your character completely intact. Nothing's changed, nothing at all. And I think that that is really the the, the hook or the the, um, the crutch for this book is that although they, they, engage, they fight each other, they get involved in helping a, a local drug ring. I mean, they never get those guys arrested at the end. No. Uh, as far as I know. <laughs> um, and they get, you know, they don't really find out who murdered their father. They get Nancy Drew's dad nearly killed, uh, and they maybe get two corrupt cops arrested. It's it's sort of it's very unclear on how many corrupt cops actually get taken down. Um, so it seems like a pretty big departure from what the Hardy Boys was supposed to be. But there's no feeling of any kind of consequence for that at all. Like it's just like no, they'll be fine. They're gonna go hug their mum. That's like the logical ending for this kind of uh, day that you've had. They zoom in on the candy bar, and it's purging all free. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I think um, in many ways that's probably the biggest issue with it. Um, there's an epi- there's a book in the case files uh, where Joe uh, departs. His his dad gets word that a hitman is out to kill a key witness. Joe gets is supposed to go and get a warning to him. The hitman catches up with Joe, beats him half to death. Joe is found by a stranger and nursed back to health. He has amnesia. He's having walking nightmares where he's reliving his girlfriend being blown up and he becomes convinced that Frank is actually the person that's done it. And so Frank is now trying to get to Joe before the the hitman finds him and finishes him. 
And so that becomes a whole thing of uh, brother versus brother where they nearly murder each other. And it's only at the end that they're able to defeat the hitman and things like that. But, you know, the, uh, the great thing about it is that the walking nightmares he's had is all consequences of the stuff that they've experienced in the previous books. So, you know, seeing his girlfriend get blown up, seeing people get killed, people dying because of his actions and things like that. So that's that's at least an interesting take to, to, to go, like that he's still haunted by this stuff, even if he's not necessarily dealing with it in any healthy way. And, and so, I mean, like, that was probably written in the early 90s. So do we... They, they knew how to set up and then pay off of it. <laughs> do we, do, should we expect more, I guess, is the question. I mean, if this is stuff that's already been done 1987, should we expect more from our Hardy Boys? Or should we expect that it should largely stay purginal free? <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to market this to, s- to such a wide audience that I feel if they were to take it to a degree that it does, quote-unquote, become the dark version of the Hardy Boys, Mm -hmm. that would probably turn the majority of the audience away from it. I mean, you could definitely make this into a CW show, right? Like, which is is the criteria that they're probably going for. That's probably like half of something on a, on a whiteboard somewhere, just like goons, um, you know, comic book, (laughs) and then CW question mark, question mark, question mark. (laughs) (laughs) Like drugs are such a, it's such a safe thing. Like, Mm -hmm. It's not human trafficking. It's not anything like, oh, they're into drugs. Oh, so hard. I mean, oh. and like, what what kind of drugs even? Like, the kind to fit into a, C, uh, a hard tiny drive. hard drive. Yeah, I mean, that is also like an awful business model because you will not be able to fit many inside that. In no, terms how many of hard like, drives were they selling? Yeah. Well, you can still resell the hard drives, you guys. You're not losing any money on the hard drives. <laughs> you can recycle. Hey, there were some really cool retro games on those hard drives. So. <laughs> it's an interesting premise, and it's interesting enough to get people like us to like, okay, well, this could be something. And it's safe enough that people who are, are into the more wholesome version of the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew get that as well. So they hedged their bets as much yep. as possible with this. Yep. I, th- I think that's a very good read of it. All right. So, Jono, if someone, well, this is an interesting question. If someone liked this but wanted something else that might be better, <laughs> what would you recommend to them? <laughs> I would recommend that they watch Knives Out. Yep. Yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, I oh. mean, like, read the Hardy Boys case files if you can get your hands on it. Um, if you like the Hardy Boys, you might like some of their other adventures. But if you wanted, uh, like, if you like Nancy Drew, apparently her reboots were much less kind to her, um, to the point where um, there was a, like a huge writing campaign about uh, the. They they said that they'd made Nancy Drew into an airhead. So potentially this is what we're seeing is a bit of a course correction on Nancy Drew. Yeah, definitely. There's probably much better detective noir stories out there that you can enjoy. Um, uh, gee. Just, uh, just Knives Out is probably like an excellent example of that. But even like watching some of like the Agatha Christie stuff, those are not necessarily as noir, but those are much twistier mysteries that at least have a, like a good payoff at the end. More compelling for sure. Yeah. Way more compelling. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess like I, I, if you ch- if you do enjoy the Hardy Boys, do check out the Case Files because if nothing else, it is. The like, case files uh, sound wild, Jono. I'm gonna try to find those. I'm kind of furious that this that this isn't an industry that I can still get into because, like, copywriting is is one thing. It's it's fine, but I, I would love the freedom that being a packaged writer sounds like it gives you. I mean, you don't necessarily get a lot of pay, and it's not like you're getting to use your own characters. But there is also like a c- certain amount of freedom. You just get to write to the go. thing, right? Like somebody hands exactly. it to you, and they're like, "Write this." That actually sounds wonderful to me I as mean, a writer. <laughs> It's like, okay, it's like, um, you know, they're hunting people for sport, but it's the Hardy Boys. <laughs> but it's it's that sort of style. It's like, uh, just take take an existing thing and we'll add the Hardy Boys. Um, and that seems like it would be, like, much easier to write than having to come up with your own ideas. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Jono, do you remember watching the movie Brick? I think we... I'm not sure if you were there for that when we watched it in Australia, but it's also a Rian Johnson movie. Oh, I, I have to watch it then. I haven't seen it myself, no. Okay, it's um, one that Cal really liked, and he had us watch it. It's, so it's basically like high school noir, and it's got Joseph Gordon-Levitt as the star. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember specifics about it, but it was very good. So I think in the Knives Out vein, I would recommend that if you're looking for your, your yeah, young excellent. adult noir. Um, I would then recommend, if we're looking, I mean, strictly at Rian Johnson, I, I would also say um, Brothers Bloom. 
which is also very good, uh, and also oh, by him. Seen, I haven't seen uh, that one. Mark Ruffalo and Adrian Brody uh, make for excellent con artist brothers. All right, Pat. I what don't, I don't reveal. Movie do you want to reveal? <laughs> I don't. I don't. Uh, is the Last Jedi? I think that's left. I was about to say that the Last Jedi. <laughs> I liked, some really interesting things. I liked it. Yeah. I liked parts of it. <laughs> I mean, we have a whole we're gonna, podcast about that. We're going to say that the Star Wars nineology ended there and did not continue, which was a strange thing for. Yeah, it's just like Indiana Jones. Jones. You know, it ended way back when, and they never yeah. made another movie. It's a shame. Yeah. It's a shame. <laughs> no, I mean, the first season of True Detective is pretty awesome if you want that kind of mystery. Oh, man, that, that's going a little that's hard a... for this book. Hey, man. But I think, hey, again, like, if, you want to, if you want something that actually has some edge, I think that that's an excellent recommendation. Yeah, That is true, actually. <laughs> um, and if you want like stories about the cops, um, definitely The Wire. Um, that's the Wire, probably... yes. But imagine The Wire, but Hardy Boys. <laughs> So maybe that's our pitch for CW guys. Uh, the wire that Hardy Boys. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what this is supposed to be, actually. Like as much as we're joking about it, <laughs> I'd say that's a fair read. Yeah. If you're looking for comic book mysteries, uh, I mean, I haven't done too much. Like the Long Halloween is probably the closest thing I've got. But if you want to talk about a book that you could drive a truck through the plot holes in, oh baby, then you should read the Long Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> well, like the Long Halloween or like Watchmen is technically a, a mystery. I enjoyed um, Gotham PD. I thought that that was a really good kind of like, again, uh, you know, Batman is always sort of present, but at least in this, he's more of like just a shadow in the background. And it's just like ordinary police having to deal with just the incredibly frustrating things that happen. Um, like dealing with the, the stress of your partner being frozen by Mr. Freeze. <laughs> so I'd, I'd say the, the, some of the mystery in that is quite good and there's there's that there's that corrupt cop kind of aspect to it as well do they bring up Blimpgate? <laughs> um, I, I don't know what that one is oh, okay well we, <laughs> they, didn't, the, they didn't really scratch the real surface of the underbelly of, uh, this podcast has a whole secret theory about why Gotham City has so many blimps flying around <laughs> oh you like to call that it Blimp Gate. We probably shouldn't bring up more gates in this episode, though, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only gate that I stand for, Matt. It's the only one I stand for. If you don't stand for Blimp Gate, you'll fall for every other gate. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Related to that, actually, is um, one of the writers of Gotham Central, Ed Brubaker, recently launched um, kind of his own take on like young adult noir called Friday, and the first issue is out, and that is actually good, and it is what you want out of this this concept. So I would recommend oh, that. That's cool. It's pay what you want too, and it's like a digital oh. download. So, um, oh, awesome, which nice. is very nice. It's very accessible. Just one last short comic. It's based off of a Neil Gaiman short story, so it's sort of cheating because you can't really compare the writing to this to Neil Gaiman. But what are you going to do? <laughs> uh, the comic book is called A Study in Emerald, and it's similar to this in the fact that it takes uh, Sherlock Holmes and takes a twist on it. I can get behind that. It's pretty fun. And it's only like one issue. It's a short story and I don't think game is going to go back to it. So it probably won't have a continuation, but mm -hmm. it's fun. So check it out. Nice. I think that that's uh yeah, I think we all agree that pretty much we wouldn't recommend this one just on the basis that it, it is not necessarily the most satisfying of, uh, of mysteries. I mean, I guess it really depends what you want out of it. Like, right. If there were people that, if they said, I really like Riverdale and I really like the Hardy Boys. I would be like, "Hey, read this book." <laughs> or like, "I really like Riverdale and I really like Nancy Drew." Like, I don't know enough about the TV series, I guess, to know if I would be like, "Hey, if you like the Nancy Drew TV series, here is this book. You will like it." Mm -hmm. Well, also, it's age appropriate. Like, you could give this to a ten-year-old and not worry about exactly. It's just dark enough to not leave mental scarring. And that gives it a huge in with libraries because libraries will publish, will purchase this and it'll go in the junior fiction section, which is, uh, you know, so typically we've got junior fiction, young adult and adult. Uh, I mean, that's just us, um, uh, you know, WA, but I mean, so what that means is you'll have junior fiction, the comic books will go out every day. Young adult, the comic books will probably sit there. There might be one or two kids that will come in and actually access them. And then adult fiction is when you'll get a lot of the comic books again being used. So... 
sort of that if this was a young adult comic book it probably wouldn't get read as much but if it's if it goes in that junior fiction area it'll be it'll be like a revolving carousel like it'll just be going in and out it's gotta get that pg-13 ready exactly yeah okay well um uh, unless you guys want to keep talking about the hardy boys series uh in which case i can just (laughs) recount everything i can remember i have actually really like i've really loved getting to hear so much about the wildness that is the actual hardy boys book and like bring that context in because i think if pat and i had just just, like randomly chosen this comic and discussed it ourselves we don't know any of that so it's actually been really great to hear that from your perspective oh well that's it's my pleasure honestly i think um it it is wild to me that they that they did go quite so far off the rails i think at one point they're exploring like an old nazi submarine things like (laughs) that so i mean you know and again you know some of the depictions of this places and things that they would encounter have had to be rewritten in the 60s because they were so bad so i think that that probably gives a bit of an idea of some of their early adventures and the and the context in which they took but um i think that you know it's 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 just not disappointing but it could have this could have been quite an interesting take on on that kind of noir mystery especially considering the the history that these boys have uh in print you know like there's 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 precedent for them to have like a wild adventure uh where there's lots of death and there's lots of betrayal and things like that and this just felt a little bit like it was too soft like they just didn't want to go as far as they had gone in the past (laughs) yeah completely agreed oh did you guys hear that nice crack of thunder (laughs) (laughs) it's an ominous (laughs) ending to our podcast (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, I, I really do need to say thank you so much again for inviting me on. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to talk comics with you guys, uh, especially given the weirdness that we've had the last couple of years, a uh, couple of months. It feels like years. <laughs> it does feel um, like years a bit. <laughs> I feel like, so I was writing for the, the blog today, and I feel like I've written so many just like comics are helping me be whole posts this, this <laughs> year, but like I wrote another one today. I was like, oh, comics, at least help me out. <laughs> Oh, I can completely understand. Yeah, just just gets you through. All right. I think that's going to do it for this month's discussion of Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys, The Big Lie. As always, if you want to get in touch with Pat or myself, you can find us on Twitter as at the Hypnotoad and at Matt Ledge, respectively. You can also email us at waitingonthetrade at gmail.com and read more comics-related goodness at mattreadscomics.com. Jono, where can people find you online, assuming you want to be found? Um, probably I'm most active on Instagram, uh, where I'm Jono Gurney, uh, all one word. Uh, and it's mostly photos of uh, where I live in Albany, Western Australia, and uh, photos of our very strange-looking dog and our two cats, uh, and sometimes food. <laughs> so uh, if that's your thing, uh, you you are very welcome. This was very enjoyable, and I feel like I have been enlightened about an entire corner of fiction that I did not know about. And like that is right. a great, great use of an hour and a half of my time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad to have provided that for both of you. 